My deep appreciation of theater history was instilled in me by Tom Empey, a college mentor to me and hundreds of others. While teaching Greek theater terms, he would grab the fabric of his slacks and say, You see these pants? Euripides, Eumenides making light of content that could be considered rather dry and stuffy while still maintaining respect for the art, which is what I want to do with this podcast. For each episode, I invite a guest from the many paths my theater career has taken me down. I give my guest no idea what we'll be talking about, but they know we're going to find an outrageous story about theater history and perhaps get a better understanding about why we're still doing it after all these years. So welcome to Euripides Humanities, and I am your host, Aaron Odom. My friends and listeners, this is Aaron Odom from Trident Theater in Sheridan, Wyoming, coming to you for another episode of Euripides, Humanities, a Theater History Podcast. I want to thank you all for coming this far on this journey with us, but if you've uh, just happened to stumble onto us or if you've been listening for a while, I just want to make sure that you're subscribing, you're following this show. Please give us some ratings. That would be really helpful to us, helps us shoot up in the uh, charts and helps us bring more content to you. But speaking of that content, I'm going to get right to it right away. Uh, this guest that I have on today, we've only been in person like maybe once or twice, but uh, I thought this person was absolutely compelling. Uh, we've been following each other on social media for a little while. She's doing some amazing things, and I'm going to do my damnedest here to get your name pronounced right. <laughs> <laughs> this is Francesca Mintov Shiz. How'd I do? That was really good, actually. Yeah, Mintoff Chij. Well done. Well, you know, you put it on your Facebook. It's like, here's how you pronounce it. I'm like, oh, okay, that's it. All right. Yeah. You got this. Yeah, it's almost like a sneeze. <laughs> <laughs> just carry some tissues with you every time you're introducing yourself. Yeah, I do. I just hand them out. <laughs> <laughs> so, Francesca, you are currently down in Savannah getting some graduate work done. So what's going on there? I am. Yeah, I'm getting my second master's degree um, and I'm getting an MFA in performance at the Savannah College of Art and Design. Right um, on. That's a great yeah. school. Great school. Yeah. It's been really fun. I have seen you just had some really cool productions like you were just in uh, All Shook Up, right? Mm -hmm. But then yep. you just directed something it looked like, right? Yeah, so I, I decided, you know, it's my second master's. I was like, let's just, you know, dive right on in. So <laughs> my first quarter, um, I was in a show and I shot two short films. And then my second quarter, I was directing two second year MFA thesis projects. So I directed Lungs by Duncan McMillan. Ooh. And I directed um, kind of a student version of Poxy's Lips, uh, which involves clowning and mime and burlesque. And it's just super physical, which is absolutely right up my alley. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, and then I was in their main stage production of All Shook Up as a member of the ensemble, which if anyone's done ensemble, you never stop. No, um, and no. And you're juggling like seven different characters. <laughs> so at one point I was like, who am I in this scene? And they were like, oh, you you full on have a halo above your head. And I was like, sweet. Awesome. Oh, that's, okay. That's, good. that's all I need to know. Not a townsperson, not a statue. We're good. Okay. All right. Cool. Um, which was great because the director as well was like, oh, um, wow, like your process, like, who are you in this scene? And I was like, not, no, not like, what am no, I feeling? No. <laughs> Just literally, <laughs> like, what am I? It was great. But the fear in her eyes, which she was like, wow, this this ensemble member wants to go real deep here. <laughs> <laughs> Just like, oh, like, God, I've, I've got one of those actors. <laughs> Yeah. Yes, it was now, great. Francesca, I first met you at a uh, Kennedy Center College uh, uh, American Theater Festival, and you were doing a, a really cool series of workshops on like movement and stuff. So that's been something that has been really important for you. Like you, you do all kinds of this stuff, like, uh, you know, fight choreography, you know, grappling, tumbling, all that kind of stuff. So how did you get into that? Um, you know, I... I Growing up in Utah, the dance scene is really heavy there. And mm -hmm. um, I mean, even if you watch a lot of commercial work, um, I swear to goodness in all the top 10 
candidates of so you think you can dance there's always someone from utah um <laughs> because it's just it's just taken so seriously seriously mm-hmm. there which is which is great um but i i did start dancing from quite a young age and then i was really into musical theater and then i kind of stopped being interested in singing and was much more interested in theater and then movement and when i started looking at getting my first master's degree i was looking at a lot of different programs and then my mom said please look at rada and i was like like i'd never get in like why would i even waste my time and for those of you listening that is the royal academy of the dramatic arts is that right you got that right okay yeah yeah so that's yeah. london um which is you know it is a phenomenal program and it's highly experimental and very much physically driven and of course it ended up being everything i was actually looking for because it combined my love for movement with my love for theater and just storytelling in general. So I stopped applying to all the other schools that I was applying to and only applied there because that's the smart thing to do. (laughs) And um, fortunately, I was fortunate enough to get in. And um, so I spent a year really diving into the work of Grotowski and Suzuki and viewpoints with Anne Bogart. And um, I worked with some pretty extraordinary artists um, who are doing who are continuing to do really amazing things. Um, nice. And uh, yeah, so I, I just really like to see what the body can do. And um, as much as actors work with phenomenal playwrights who have this ability to pen down beautiful f- communication, I'm always curious to see mm-hmm. what can be communicated without words. Um, I have you on this show today because Speaking of being transformative with bodies and what we can communicate as we be, as we start as one thing and become something else, I did send you a little bit of a cheat on what we were going to be talking about. Did you watch that? Oh no, you sent me a, a video a thing no? to okay. show. Oh no, I didn't. Oh, oh that's that's fine. That's uh-huh. fine. That's fine. But I do. I have seen this. Yes, I, fantastic. You have seen this. Okay. I sent Francesca the video of Jason Siegel doing his Dracula's Lament, which is a song he sang in Forgetting Sarah Marshall, but he actually did it on, it looks like a late yeah. night talk show. And he actually performed it with his puppet, with with the Dracula. And it uh, it sounds like it's pretty much written as a cure song. <laughs> 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 and it's just amazing. With that in mind, then, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Here. And... Here is a long quote. I don't even know what the source of this is, it's, uh, but it's a review of some sort that a friend of mine sent me. Here we go. Why on earth Terry Denton de Grey has revived his grandfather's vampire play, The Power of the Cross, is beyond all reasoning, judging by the first performance at Town Hall High Wycombe. I should have listened to the bad vibes. <laughs> Tickets had not been reserved for me on arrival at the venue, but unfortunately seats were available oh. and i was still able to witness this incredulous production <laughs> Ooh, gets better with some of the performances as stiff as the cardboard cutout scenery and some irritatingly amateurish caricaturizations oh. it was a toss-up between desperate sobs or hysterical laughter most of the audience plumped for the hysterics oh dear <laughs> To add to the amusement, the scenes were set incorrectly and one character had to make his entrance through a window twice. Admittedly, there is some humor in the 90-year-old script, but the serious (laughs) bits were definitely more funny. This, quote, compelling or complex and thrilling melodrama was about as complex as watching paint dry and not half as thrilling. At the risk of embarrassing anyone, the few cast members who made any sort of impression will remain anonymous. End quote. Oh no. <laughs> and as I researched this, I, I I began to realize what kind of an art there is in writing a bad review. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's poetry at times. Yeah. So anyway, this is from a review that was sent to me from my uh, by my good friend Richard Jordan, who's a London-based theater producer and journalist. And you may remember Richard from my past episodes, most notably nine and ten, when we d- uh, dissected the Spider-Man Broadway musical. But dissection is what I have in mind again today, and I intend for this to be a pretty interesting discussion and possibly a debate. So whereas I usually start with a question of my guest, I want to see your response. Why don't vampire musicals work on Broadway? Oh, well, 
I mean, where do we even begin? I think, I think that there's, um, you know, and, and especially coming from a person who is so passionate about stage work, who has found herself in a school that emphasizes film. I'm like, Oh, you can get away with, so, you can get away with so much more on camera. Uh, so I, I think part of that, you know, there's a reason why vampire books succeed because the imagination mm -hmm. of the reader yep. really yep. allows us to transcend what we're reading um, and and make it as grotesque and as gory as we want. But then I think on stage, you're seeing the clumsiness of everything. You're so vulnerable on stage. And it is also, anytime you're on stage, we are asking you to suspend your disbelief. And right. when you're dealing with vampires, uh, it's really <laughs> It's really hard. Yeah, you got to hook uh, them early and keep them there. Yeah. So, yeah, that's that's my gut instinct is just that. Okay. Th that's yeah, not a like good it's idea. like it's an impossible genre or type of thing to put on stage and make it work. Yeah, I mean, like, what are you going to do with something like Twilight the Musical? I mean, are you just going <laughs> to cover cover Edward in glitter, the herpes of the stage, every time he comes out? I mean, I like... hope so. I hope so. Let's do it. <laughs> we oh have God. yet to have a beautiful lighting <laughs> cue that allows someone to glitter. Uh, we can cover them in rainbows and sunshine, but... I don't know. I bet there's an opportunity for really cool projection at something like that. Uh, a but it would a have to be, like, so projection. focused. Yeah. Right. It would have to be so focused and, oh, God. But here we are seriously considering Twilight to be a musical, and I don't want to even... Please, no. Please, no one yeah. ever. Like, mm -mm. The, the world just redeemed Robert Pattinson uh, with the Batman. Let's just, let's not. Okay. Um, Batman the musical, <laughs> though. I mean, we're talking about vampires. Bats, Batman the musical. Mm -hmm. Would it go down in flames like Spider-Man? I Well, okay. See, on that episode, we also talked about it's a bird, it's a plane, it's Superman which was on Broadway for a, a little while. It did flop. It only lasted about maybe six weeks before they closed it. But, um, you know, the, the, the writers had just recently done Bye Bye Birdie. So it wasn't the writers. It might just be, yeah, it's a fantastical thing that's impossible to put on stage. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe we'll find out. <laughs> so... I reached out to Richard, who gave me that uh, uh, that review. Uh, I reached out to him on this topic because as a commercially and artistically successful theater producer, Richard seems to keep his finger on the pulse of today's theater climate quite well. Cool. He responded to me with a full column that he wrote on this exact topic for the British theater magazine, The Stage, which Richard contributes to quite regularly. So... In his article, he suggests that creating an atmosphere and suspense on stage is so much more difficult than producing the same effect in film or television. Yeah. I mean, you know, you've got a lot of stuff you do in post-production to make something look really scary or sound really scary. Now, however, it can be done, but without the vis those visual and, and uh, audio effects, Richard suggests that for a play to produce an atmosphere of fear and horror, then what we have is the words of the play to build the suspense required. While it hasn't worked universally for vampires, it certainly has worked for ghost stories. You know, The Woman in Black was one of the longest running plays in the West End, and it basically uses clever set pieces and sounds with two actors to create its terror. Why can't vampires do the same? <laughs> well, you know, I, I'm almost intrigued about the reality of the situation. You know, I think with ghosts, it's what you see and what you don't see. Right. And it very much is what you hear. Yes. Um, but I'm, I'm I want to go like really far back in time and just compare Greek and Roman theater for a moment, because I think yeah. um, the Greeks were a very peaceable society. They didn't love war. So mm -hmm. they wanted to hide all of these violent acts by talking about what happened instead of showing them on stage, which now oh, we yeah, yeah. revivals of, you know, Oedipus Rex, for example, and just like <laughs> the puncturing of the eyes. And um, yeah, and you, you can see the blood squirt and all that. Yeah. Uh, which if you haven't read Oedipus El Rey by um, Luis Alfaro, um, oh. Yocasta punctures his eyes with her fingers and I like oh, it's so grotesque and like gorgeous and I'm obsessed um, but uh, and that would happen on stage so we can like take these opinions and kind of change them but then like you get the Romans and you get these gladiator games and it's like well yeah because if you kill someone if you suck their blood if you're not actually doing that yeah we're not horrified or excited 
Right. Um, or if there's or if there's not that uh, imminent danger of those things happening. Right? Yeah. The real ri- the real belief in the risk. Mm-hmm. Um, yes. Which I I just think, and you know, I was also taking another combat class this quarter, and it's like, how do we mask? How do we mask this? Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. if you can't successfully mask it, we don't believe it. So it makes oh, sense. We're not going to believe if, it. If vampires can't be, if they're the falsity of them on stage isn't masked well enough, of course the most serious moments are going to be hilarious. Right, um, right, right, right. So, well, I think I've, I've, I've picked apart some things that might be good, uh, you know, thinking points here. Um, so, to start figuring this out, I suggest it would probably be appropriate to have something of a baseline, right? Like an understanding of what makes a good vampire story. So maybe we'll start with the story, okay? So I found this blogger, his name is C.T. Phipps, who has published vampire novels himself, and he writes a list which isn't necessarily law, but a pretty good set of guidelines to making a good vampire story. Now, I'm using this list because, well, I've never written a vampire story, been in a vampire play, or seen too many vampire plays that I have enjoyed. I've seen like one or two, and I went, yeah, no, you didn't didn't get it. (laughs) But this guy has published many books, and he he wrote this list after publishing his book titled Straight Out of Fangton, Fangs Like Vampire Fangs, which is available on Amazon. Thank you for Uh, explaining that to me, uh, or to your audiences, I mean, (laughs) in case we we missed it. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) Oh, no. Phipps List comes from a place of respecting and honoring the genre of vampire novels, but also trying to come up with something of something new that will allow authors new ideas about vampires. So, you know, when you are creating your new vampire world, you've got to give them like different things that haven't happened before. And like you were mentioning earlier, I mean, for Twilight to be like, this is why vampires don't go in the sun. It's because <laughs> they glitter in the sun. You're like, that was a jump. That was a jump. And everybody went, nah, I'm out. I'm out. (laughs) So I'm going to go over just a few of these rules that Phipps wrote, as most of the plays we'll discuss are adaptations of other vampire stories rather than truly original works, which may be the problem overall. (laughs) And plus, the rules I list here lend themselves more to theatrical interpretation rather than writing a new universe of vampiredom. So in order, here they are. Stop with the Mary Sudom of vampirism. Are you familiar with that term, a Mary Sue? Okay, Mm. so in literary works, basically this rule is saying, don't make your protagonist a person that could easily solve whatever problem is before them. Uh, So in novels, these are characters who almost have no reason to be as powerful or as capable as they are since they often come from humble backgrounds. But some examples do exist in the greater popular culture. James Bond is a perfect example. He is absolutely impervious, gets himself out of everything, is ultimately sexy to whoever he comes across. You know, yeah, he might have a few scrapes and scars at the end, but uh, he still looks pretty damn good when he's done. Oh, oh hey, there, there's another one. Um, uh, and, and God, we're gonna, I, we need to stop mentioning Twilight, but I wrote it in here. Uh, Bella Swan from yeah. the Twilight series. Is a perfect like she has absolutely no no reason to become the vampire goddess she becomes. She starts a series as this mopey and frankly average teenage girl. Yeah, one hundred percent. Right. So, but for creating interesting vampires, they need to have something that is still impossible for them to get around, like the need to sleep during the day, especially in coffins, which seal out light completely. Mm -hmm. This makes your vampires flawed in some way and thus more interesting. And there you go, theatrical characters. It's an absolute must in theater. Your protagonist needs to have something that is hard for them to get around. Yeah. Right? Okay. So when you have vampires that, don't do that like they're impossibly sexy and they can survive anything you're like this is just not interesting so the mary yeah. suda okay? okay that's a problem here's the next one don't make your vampires inherently romantic yeah give them some level of repulsion i mean they are monsters after all yeah so inst- so instead of being utter sex gods make them ugly in some way like Um, make the way they feed like absolutely ghastly. Uh, I I mean, on the other hand, we have been accustomed to vampires in live performance being in the midst of romantic pursuit, which often makes for a good story. I mean, you know, the Dracula story is a great story and he's, he's always in, in, in the pursuit of Mina, who he believes is his one great love. 
okay, fine. But he also turns into a mist, <laughs> turns into a bat. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, he, he a, a wolf he, at one point. Yeah, he's still an animal. Yeah, yeah. So he's like freaky and weird and disgusting. But in any case, to sum those two rules up, avoid making your vampires romance co- uh, romance cover models in pursuit of the greatest love story ever written. Oh, and speaking of appearance, let your vampires be horrifying. Yeah. Now, this is where we might find some difficulty on stage. Like you were saying, it's a lot more effective with sound and, and you know, practical effects to do a ghost story. You know, you don't necessarily always see them, but like if a rocking chair suddenly starts moving, right. which, is a, which is an easy thing to do, you're like, oh, God, I didn't expect to see that. Yeah, right? 100%. Now, one thing that Phipps is very clear about is to remind his reader that vampires are monsters and do monstrous things. Therefore, the threat of their horror shouldn't be more than a hair's breadth away. Here's, here's a quote from him. Most vampire fiction actually forget being one of the undead is supposed to be awful. I've mentioned giving back weaknesses to sunlight and de-romanticizing them, but one thing I think will really help a vampire's depiction is outright atrocity. It's easy to let vampire victims be assholes or people the audience has no attachment to. It's quite another to have vampires, sympathetic or otherwise, tear into those who the audience likes. Yeah, I agree with that. We're going to be talking about it here, uh, uh, but like the character of Lucy in in, in the Dracula story, this is like his central victim, you know? And she's this cute, quirky, very headstrong, rich little snot. (laughs) But it's somebody that is like an endearing character in all of that. Yeah, I think it's interesting that in all of the vampire stories that we have gone over, um, the vampire is always male and the victim is always female. Um, Right, right. God, uh, that's so interesting. But also like there, there's that, you know, parallel to women finding these kind of uh, aggressive personality is very attractive so it's easy for them to be ensnared um, as right. opposed to the other way around but I would be curious to see either a complete mockery of the sexual uh, tension between vampire and victim. No that's interesting you say that because the next rule that he comes up with is don't try to parody but play it straight even when parodying Aha. okay so here, Fip suggests that while there are tons of jokes that can be made about Dracula and Twilight series, you know, I want to suck your blood and seriously, vampires <laughs> don't glitter. Say it again. <laughs> Do it again. <laughs> oh. <laughs> the jokes, the jokes are old and can lose an audience quickly. This is why what we do in Shadows has been so successful. Have you mm. seen the movie or the TV show? Uh, I've seen the movie. Yeah. Freaking brilliant. You know, they play it straight in 100%. Like Taika Waititi, brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. And he came up with the idea, well, if vampires have been around for centuries, then they certainly would have gone through the age of foppery in (laughs) (laughs) Victorian times and taken some, you know, frilly little fancy boy. And that's that's who he is. He's not anything more than I left my snuff box, you know? I mean, (laughs) and, and that's... That's now this horrifying thing that takes people's lives away because he needs to drink their blood to survive. So, I mean, even though the film and TV series does mock vampire tropes, they're accepting the rules of that vampire universe as fact. Mm -hmm. Like they go, okay, so here's one vampire who's, uh, you know, an ultimate sex machine and that's how he lures his victims. But then they've got the Nosferatu in the basement who looks like a shriveled corpse. And, you know, every now and then just needs to, needs to come out and feed and they they take him out and you know walk him i guess you know <laughs> here you go saved you some <laughs> yeah, exactly exactly and that's that's just the world they live in and they're not ever questioning the reality of that world and that's why that series i think works so well is they don't question it at all or give you a reason to go yeah but why did you have a loophole here in your mythology yeah, and I, I also think, you know, we're, we're forgetting about adaptability. And, and anytime we look at creatures, and especially humans, and any kind of human thing, like a vampire, mm-hmm. um, right. surely they've discovered ways to blend in, go into the sunshine, do this, oh, do yeah. that. Do, I'm sure like there's a, and I almost think of Dexter in this. Okay. Like, how does, how does a creature survive um, mm-hmm. in a world and pertain to their rules while still satisfying their own thirst for blood um, right 
and not to compare a serial killer to a vampire, but. But hey, no, that that is a human monster yeah. amid people who aren't that and yeah. blending into them. Hmm, I like that. So surely like that. we've adopted. I mean, like maybe there's, you know, prescription sunscreen that they've invented. They did that in Blade in the, in the first Blade movie. That Yep, the guy had sunscreen on and it didn't always work but he could be out there for, you know, maybe 20, 30 minutes. That's or maybe they try, maybe all the vampires thrive where there's no sun, like England. There you um, go. You know, <laughs> and I say that with love because I've lived there for so long and because I'm British, but, you know, we... like. <laughs> My vampire coven is settling in Portland. Uh... <laughs> We are thriving. Come join us. <laughs> we are thriving. And it's great here. There's many a rainstorm with which to hide. Um, <laughs> and you can blend your blood with kale smoothies. And yes. Drinks. Oh my gosh. That's the story. <laughs> that's oh the my story. gosh. That's the story. I want a Vampires superfood smoothie. Like a super, super <laughs> smooth, like superfood smoothie or like. Oh, that's so great. That's, that's awesome. That's so great. <laughs> So, in my opinion, uh, I, I, I'm going to end with uh, Phipps' rules here. I mean, the other ones that he has aren't so great for, like, uh, telling adapted stories on the stage. Like, balance out your vampire rules, for example, like, for every power, make sure they have a weakness. Uh, keep your vampire numbers intimate, but we'll talk about a play here where that rule shouldn't apply for stage work. You know, like, have only one or two per the story. And you're like, yeah. in some cases, like, there's one story we're going to talk about here in a little while where we don't know how many vampires there are in the world. And then in one scene, you just get an explosion of them. And you're like, oh my God, this is a much bigger problem than I thought. But uh, let's see. Um, oh, and, and this, is, this is a great one that he mentions. He says, make sure to include vampires that represent races other than white Europeans, which is just another good note for theater overall now, right? I mean, why uh, do vampires always have to be white? Or as you said, always have to be male. I mean, I just, yeah. So anyway, arguably the most successful story that everybody knows is Dracula and mm -hmm. arguably the most successful production of a vampire play on Broadway was Dracula opening on October 13th, 1977 and starring Frank Langella in the title role. Play was actually, uh, uh, it was a revival of a script adapted from Stoker's novel by the Irish actor Hamilton Dean in 1924 so he could play it in Ireland. Hey. And then it was seen and revised by an American playwright, John Balderston, in 1927. And this version that Balderston did was produced in the U.S. in October 1927 and featured Bella Lugosi in the lead role. Uh -uh. And this, is, this is his first English-speaking role. The play went on and did a national tour for the next two years and culminated in the classic film starring Lugosi. There we go. I did not Boom. know this. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, we're all pretty familiar with the basic story of Dracula, right? I mean, yep. a young woman has uh, been getting sick and she's uh, engaged to be married and, and eventually gets married in the story, but then becomes a vampire. And they all figure, they get, they finally get this, uh, this eccentric psychiatrist who comes in and he's like, I'm pretty sure it's vampires. And, <laughs> and they find Count Dracula and kill him. So... <laughs> I was going to mention but, something about uh, U.S. healthcare, but I'm not going <laughs> to. <laughs> it's obviously, obviously. Very expensive doctor. <laughs> but what about ivermectin? Um, okay. Uh, now, the script of this Langella production uh, focuses primarily on Van Helsing being called to investigate the strange sickness of Lucy, only to discover she's indeed the victim of a vampire who steals into her bedroom and drains her blood late at night when no one's looking. <laughs> Van Helsing inspires several men to seek out the vampire. Some of the men follow a servant of Dracula to his hiding place, and the men drive a stake through Dracula's heart, killing him. Okay, yep. so there you go. So 50 years after this script first graced the Great White Way, it rose from its coffin. I'm sorry, I wrote so many of these puns in here. I'm it rose from its coffin. Sorry at all. <laughs> Good. No. Rose from its coffin in 1977 with the ever intriguing Frank Langella as the world's most well known bloodsucker. With generally positive re reviews for the acting, the play did make a few questionable choices in production. For example, the first being the color palette and the setting and the costume. Pretty much everything was a dreary gray, but the, set against this melodramatic Sherlock Holmes type of story. I've seen a couple of the set pieces. I've seen the posters. 
And it would be like, you describe a bad dream to your therapist and they go, here, draw it for me. And they hand you a piece of paper and a black ink pen. And that's what the set looked like. <laughs> it was like, uh, like they're, the primary set piece was in a library where they'd start putting the pieces together and everything, but it was just drawn. It didn't like put this into like a real world context. It felt like yeah. it was more of like a mystery story that involved a vampire. Yeah. It does. Okay, cool. Now, nonetheless, with all of this in mind, this play ran for 925 performances on Broadway. And uh, Langella's performance was so popular that this production was adapted for film in 1979 and Langella starred again opposite Laurence Olivier as Van Helsing. Hey! Right? And I, I just like piecing these all together. They're just like little trivia facts. When he left the production, guess who filled in for Langella? Uh, who replaced him? I don't know. Raul Julia. No. Uh-huh. Wow. <laughs> All right. So, so like these big, amazing names that have some uh, outstanding acting talent. Yeah. Clearly drawn to this character for. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh huh. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> mm -hmm. So that's all well and good for vampires on Broadway, but it wasn't a musical. So a small attempt was made in 1987 with a play called Possessed, the Dracula musical. And while it had its eyes for Broadway, it opened and closed in Teaneck, New Jersey in a relatively short amount of time. So here's a, uh, here's a review that I found uh, for that production. This adaptation has had far from a laudable legacy with lyrics such as love sucks. It drains all your blood. <laughs> love sucks. You better listen to me, bud, and leave it to the donkeys, the doggies, and the ducks, quack, quack. I mean, um... Yeah, set to okay. 80 synthesizers on a nearly bare stage, it is hardly life-changing art. That's the end of the quote. Yep, okay. <laughs> I'm, yeah, I was hoping to be profoundly changed just in yeah. hearing quotes, but uh, alas... No, uh, I, so I, I, yeah, don't want to see possessed. So it almost <laughs> had, it almost had no set. It just felt undercooked. And plus, since most of the reviews were negative, most Broadway producers started to think that it wasn't just this play and production that were, weren't attractive. It was the concept of vampire musicals that couldn't be done on Broadway. They saw this one, they heard the terrible reviews and they're like, well, that's just a franchise. It's never going to work. Huh. So vampires didn't really get to Broadway again for a further 15 years. The 2000s actually saw three separate attempts to capitalize on the vampire musical on Broadway and all met with virtually the same success. None. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Why don't you tell our listeners? <laughs> Earlier, you said something about, I'd love to see a mockery of this. Uh, oh my God. This story, I could do a whole episode on this next one. There was so much here, but I'm like, ah, I want to talk about the vampire musical in general. But anyway, in 2002, a play which had already seen some great success in Austria and Germany was looking to enter English language markets. The show was Dance of the Vampires, a stage adaptation of Roman Polanski's cult classic horror comedy, Fearless Vampire Killers, or Pardon Me, But Your Teeth Are on My Neck. <laughs> <laughs> I hope that's a line in the play. Uh, pardon me, your teeth are on my neck. Oh, yeah. I just noticed. That seems out of place. Please don't <laughs> puncture my artery while you're there. I would, I would rather you didn't. <laughs> I'd rather <laughs> like them intact. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Lord. I'll do my best to summarize the plot. Oh, gosh. Professor Abronsius and his meek sidekick, Alfred, are traveling the Carpathian Mountains to search for proof that vampires exist. They stop in a small town where Alfred becomes enamored with the daughter of the innkeeper of the inn they're staying at. This daughter, her name is Sarah, is also the amorous target of Count von Krolock, who very quickly reveals he's a vampire. Like, no, no secret there. Uh, like... <laughs> <laughs> the first time we see him, he bursts through the ceiling of the girl's bathroom where she's taking a bath and tries to bite her and, and spook her. Oy. 
So hijinks ensue. Sarah is kidnapped to the Count's castle, which is scheduled to have a huge annual ball in which all the vampires meet and have a good feast. The professor and Alfred manage to infiltrate the ball, barely escape with Sarah, but we find out that she's already turned been, turned into a vampire. She bites Alfred, no. and the vampires disappear into the woods, allowing the curse of vampirism to spread. Oh, no. I know. It's happening. That was the origin story. So, well, there you go. Now, while the German language script was something of a serious gothic rock opera, <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> okay, I can see how you could make that serious, but the source material was definitely very tongue in cheek, very, very like, eh, 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 you know, nudge, nudge. Yeah. Like, it was written by the same creative team behind the Rebecca musical, which we discussed in episode 19, that has seen huge success in every market but Broadway. Like, there was a huge scandal behind that. Go back and listen to episode 19 if you want to know. <laughs> the producers of the English language version sunk their teeth into this project <laughs> but wanted to make some air quotes improvements yeah. yeah and don't you love that when you're like hey we have this really cool thing and we're gonna take it to broadway uh i suggest some changes before we do that <laughs> <laughs> uh, what, what what would you think if there was a dog one of them carried all the time no of course uh, and let's make them all children just to, um, yeah, I mean, just to merge, you know, Annie and the Wizard of Oz into the <laughs> vampire movie, because those are those marketable. Are, those are really classic. People seem to like those. People like kids and dogs and kids vampires. And dogs so and vampires. let's just uh, let's smush them. merge. No. Yeah. No, I'm not, I'm not suggesting that happen. But at this time... <laughs> <laughs> we might have just created a recipe for success though. <laughs> <laughs> but there is, a, there, there is a show there is a show out there called the musical of musicals the musical oh, and it merges no. like everything and they even include like a chandelier from phantom of the phantom to come crashing down onto the stage uh, yeah <laughs> excellent so no in 2002 adaptations of film comedies were becoming popular so like the producers yeah okay yeah and we all, you know, as we suggested, the cult following of Polanski's goofy muse, uh, goofy movie, you know, they're like, okay, so people, people want to have fun with this. They want to see it funny. Yeah. Okay. So basically they were going to do that great old showbiz thing where they take something that's working and improve on it for Broadway. And what it sounds like they intended to do is make this, this <laughs> they wanted to make this show, the production value on the same scale of Phantom of the Opera, but somewhat oh. satirized but like somewhat satirize the genre. <laughs> like I'm just uh, watching the gears turn in your head and like things are tripping. <laughs> yeah, I wish I wish the audience could see my eyes squinting because it's most <laughs> unattractive and also hilarious. <laughs> As I'm trying to work just, this out. You're like, uh, this, okay, okay. Like, like you're wanting to root for it. I see it. Yeah, <laughs> if I were a producer and you were interviewing with me for a project, you would very much be able to see how transparent I was in my very quickly gain for oh, this idea. Okay. okay, so you're not, oh, okay, fine. <laughs> So, as we'll see in later entries here, the unfortunate side of bringing a show to the biggest commercial theater market in the world can be fairly complex. Now, I mentioned the improving of the show because when it started to be developed for Broadway, the script was written and rewritten several times, which, like, I get adapting it for the English language and like there might be phrases in the German language course, that, that, don't, that don't make sense here. I can understand that, but that's not what was going on. <laughs> they were uh, like, they, you know, they took ba the basic line of the story and just started writing different things around it that basically had nothing to do, but kind of fit the mold of let's make this a funny adaptation of a, of a movie. Cool. So um, for listeners, mm -hmm. that is the recipe for success. That's the true one is to take something <laughs> that has uh, been successful in a foreign language and bastardize it. And, and completely. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. We've... Well done. <laughs> there is one that I wish I would have put on here um, uh, that was a really cool adaptation and I want to do it someday is the, the uh, Let the Right One In. Ah. Oh God. Have you ever seen that? Uh -uh. Swedish movie about uh, uh, like a 13 year old boy in uh, an apartment building in, um, in Sweden. He gets a new neighbor next door. And one night he's out in the little courtyard of the, the apartment building playing on like the, the monkey bars or something. And he looks up at the room at the house or the apartment next to his. And they're like 
taping cardboard up over the window and you're like i see that sometimes maybe that guy works at night and has to sleep during the day or something turns out his next door neighbor uh is um like the keeper of a girl vampire like she's 11 years old and anyway it like becomes this amazing story of how dangerous codependency can be because that's what this girl has been doing like she's been grooming like somebody to take care of her by finding these absolute loners who just need somebody to go you know what you have a purpose in this world and it's to be loved by me when really it's you're there to find the victims for me so I don't have to go out and hunt yeah and then once that person gets caught for murdering people then she goes and finds another one I just, yeah, I think that's a really interesting take on it. And I also think um, it just triggered a thought about keeping vampires for pets. Mm, I like that. And like, like that. And having to go hunt for them. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a really, you know, I've, I feel like having spent so much time in Wyoming too, I can see like these hunters going like hunting for deer um, <laughs> in air quotes, which the audience yep. can't see me do. <laughs> Um, and bringing back either carcasses, um, for Mm -hmm. the vampires to feed on or, and then you can see them like, and it's like twisted and bizarre because then they go out line dancing and right. Um, (laughs) vampires like you've never seen them before. They're cowboys. Um, (laughs) but, uh, oh, oh, oh man, I'm getting so many ideas here. Okay. Anyway, we're excited. Uh, Yes. Okay. (laughs) So going back to this of taking us. Oh, the reason I brought that, let the right one in up is because Hollywood did readapt it. And Chloe Grace Moritz was the girl vampire. Oh, okay. And that, that one was called let me in. uh, Uh, Cause there's that old vampire myth of you have to invite them in. You have to invite them in. Yeah. 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 Um, And that's, that's what uh, the, yeah, the first one was. Oh, I like that. Uh, yeah, yeah. And I think out of like most of these bastardized adaptations we were talking about, that one might have been like the most successful that I've seen. Cool. Because it's like, you know, girl with a dragon tattoo. It yeah. was fine. We didn't need another one of those, but we got some really cool performances and sick, weird art out of it. But anyway, so back to <laughs> Dance of the Vampires. Um, the musician brought in for the score and lyrics was Jim Steinman who wrote and produced a lot of pop music in the 80s and 90s. Okay. And it's something of a love ballad between Sarah and Count Von Krolock. Steinman wrote a song of his, he rewrote a song of his to fit the show. The song was Total Eclipse of the Heart. Oh. Uh, <laughs> no. Are you serious? Yep. Yep. And it's actually really good. Like, I like it a lot. Um, you can find it on YouTube. I'll send it to you after we're done here. Uh, yeah. But the production itself was maligned from the beginning. The writers couldn't decide what play they were writing. Michael Crawford of Phantom of the Opera fame was cast to play the Count, and he demanded and was rewarded complete creative control of his character, including costume design. Yep, yep. Making it completely, absolutely difficult to write around his demands. On a side note, never give an actor that much power. Never. Never, because like, it, it's an it's an ensemble work, but he always, he, always he's the draw. Like <sighs> you put the title at the top, put his name under the bottom, you're gonna sell tickets. Oh my no! Regardless of how big your ego is, you never deserve to have that much power when you are are incapable of being an outside eye. Yeah, and he oh my god, Ugh. he did so many things that were so ridiculous. Like he was so in control of his costume design. And so obsessed with his weight gain since his Phantom of the Opera days that like he he made sure that there was a ruffled collar around his neck because he he didn't want anybody to look at his jowls. I mean, to be fair, I am always drawn to a man's jowls. (laughs) (laughs) First thing I see. (laughs) <laughs> I mean, that's how I, that's how I judge my next partner. I mean, victim. I mean, partner. Oh, oh! I knew it. I knew there was a reason I had you on the show. <laughs> how did now, you know? <laughs> you combine this all with the director who had directed Urine Town on Broadway, but nothing of this scale, and a choreographer whose advice on staging big dance numbers was just rock on. <laughs> 
Yeah, sounds about right. Sounds like a, a dream show. I don't think it was a fair chance to show what a vampire musical could do on Broadway. No. no. Jim Steinman, the musician, didn't even show up for opening night. Here are, here are some of his quotes about the production. We ended up with two shows at war with each other. One was sensual and gothic. The other was camp Rocky horror. I knew the critics would kill us for that. We were the perfect target, a fat lady with a sign on her back that said, kick me. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Here's another one. The producer wanted a musical comedy. We were told to put five jokes on every page. Oh, <laughs> That's too many. That's, too, That's many. Way too many. That's way too many. Please. Yeah. No, I was, I was playing, I was playing a game um, last night in preparation for another uh, session thing I have later on today and it's called Jackbox, but you can come up with your own jokes, but they kind of give you like the setup for it. And then your fellow teammates have suggested words. Um, <laughs> so I had a joke that I had to create yesterday. And it was like um, life at middle school was like, and I got to pick from three different words. And ironically, one of them was Dracula. So I put my life at middle school was like Dracula. And then I put as my punchline, I wrote it sucked. <laughs> which, which I was like pretty pleased about. <laughs> Damn uh, was funny. Right. We, we don't need five jokes like that per page, though. No, no, no. And they would have they would have had them. They had them. Yeah, it was. Rough. Oh, gosh. So another huge problem arose for Dance of the Vampires. Social media. <laughs> I mean, it was early days. This is like 2002. So it was like, you know, um, Just really like community off. forums or, or something like that. You didn't have a MySpace. You, Facebook wasn't even around for another like four years. But you mm -hmm. had, you know, chat rooms. You had AOL. And everybody was starting to talk about this. Oof. I mean, this was just like um, on the episode I had with Richard Jordan, he was talking about uh, Andrew Lloyd Webber's Love Never Dies, the Phantom of the Opera sequel. Mm -hmm. Internet trolls got a hold of it and just jammed a stake in the show's heart again and again. Ah! So as far as Dance of the Vampires, it didn't necessarily go viral, but it sure didn't help the show's chances. No. After 61 preview performances... Dance of the Vampires opened on December 9th, 2002 and closed on January 25th, 2003 after only 56 performances. Ah, oh, man. Mm -hmm. The critics all seem to indicate that the show just didn't know what it wanted to be and a lot of them heaped tons of punishment on Crawford's performance. <laughs> Ouch. I mean, uh, uh, well, that was... Uh, yeah, that's one thing I, I, didn't, I didn't say it, but um, I guess when he would be reading the script in rehearsals, and some other character would have a joke, he'd go back to the writers and go, that's, no, he doesn't get jokes. I get the jokes. I get jokes. I get jokes. Nobody else can be funny. Ego. <laughs> yeah. uh, I'm the, I'm the uh, you know, the uh, amazing and gothic and uh, austere uh, vampire god, and I'm funny no. as hell. Nope. And nobody else can be funny. Uh, yeah. But okay. this production reached a new record it was one of the biggest flops on Broadway, losing approximately twelve million dollars. No, yeah, oh my gosh. <laughs> that's rough. That, that is, is rough. rough. That is rough. I mean, I think at one point they it was like two or three weeks into the production. They're going, you know, these six thousand dollar daily ticket sales just aren't going to meet our weekly demands of six hundred thousand yeah. dollars. It's just not gonna, yeah. Ooh, that <laughs> so is like, so rough. Oh, that lost a lot of money. A lot Ouch. of money. Ouch. So you think maybe we'd stop there, right? And let vampires and musicals stay apart for a little while, right? One would hope. In August 2004, composer Frank Wildhorn's... Jacqueline... No. Jacqueline. No. Did you yes, just yes, the musical it, before Jekyll and Hyde? At, no, 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 no. Jekyll and Hyde came first, and then they went, <gasps> oh, that, that kind of worked. Let's have him do Dracula. Oh, I had no idea. Uh-huh, uh-huh. You know why? Closed so fast. It opened at the Belasco Theater after only 22 previews. Now, I have to admit, I couldn't find a lot of information on the pre-production process of this show. Uh, but from the interviews I've read with cast members, they didn't expect it to do poorly. Like, huh. um, one of them is Kelly O'Hara. I'm going to talk about her in just a moment. But the interview she had, they're like, everybody's doing great. I think it's a really cool show. This is really fun. And I can see, like... I, I think I saw, yeah, I saw some pictures of it and I went, whoa, that actually probably would have done great. But much as famed New York Times critic Ben Brantley did for his review of this show, 
I'll start by listing the high points. That's the tactic that Bren ben, oh, ben Brantley took. He oh li- he was like, I can't even tell you how terrible this is, so I'm going to just mention the good stuff. And this is, again, how great review writers approach their work. I mean, wow. So reviews generally said that the technical elements of the show were really astonishing. The sets were huge and ornate. They would move and rise and split at very unexpected times, just like dazzling to see. And on top of that, a special fly team was brought in. And at many times, characters would be like flying or drifting overhead, uh, doing somersaults in the air, diving into graves, and simply floating or gliding across the stage to a delightfully eerie effect. And I'm like, now that's, there you go. You're starting to, you're starting to use the technology in a way that will make vampires a believable thing or something that when something unexpected happens, you've already hooked us into the believability of this world and taking a little step, like maybe somebody drifts off the floor a few feet. Yeah. Oh, that's spooky. Like, I like that. Okay. Now, now you got me. What else can these things do? Right. (laughs) What it didn't have going for it was an interesting story. (laughs) Oh, dear. And to be fair, I mean, Bram Stoker was not exactly the greatest author, but he did give us, obviously, an intriguing plot line. But this story of the Dracula musical left out most of the horror, left out a lot of the suspense, and leaned heavily on a love story that really did not have audiences feeling very romantic. As Ben Brantley put it, quote, it isn't simply bad, it's bad and boring. Uh, <laughs> so oh it's, no. you know, like, I mean, oh, I, you've been to those. We've all seen those. Like, I want, yeah. I, I just want this to be over because I'm not only am I not vibing with it, but it's, there's nothing happening. Nothing I know happening. it's amazing how forgiving we are as audience members, even if we're not educated theater folk, right. you know, like who know what to right. look for. There are times where I'll be like, nothing about this is redeeming, except my goodness, those costumes are well constructed. Right. And we'll I go, just can't okay. wait to see them move. Yeah. <laughs> right. uh, yeah. 100%. Um, yep. uh, so thus it was the awful lyrics, the terrible book, and mostly the horridly over melodramatic music that just put this show underground. And I don't know him all that well, but what from what I understand, he's pretty divisive. I mean, I mentioned Frank Wildhorn. You're like, Jekyll and Hyde! Like, yeah. there are those people who really like that show. There are also the critics who are like, you seem to know how to make big music, but not necessarily really good music. Uh-huh. You know, he's, he's no Andrew Lloyd Webber. I'll say that. But Frank Wildhorn, you know, did Jekyll and Hyde, the Scarlet Pimpernel, and the Civil War, and arguably the most successful of those was Jekyll and Hyde. The other two kind of sunk pretty, pretty steadily. So anyway, Dracula did last a little bit longer than its predecessor. It opened on August 19th, 2004, and closed on January 2nd, 2005, after 157 performances. Way! So it lasted through the fall and winter. Critics generally pan the play for being utterly boring and cheaply bombastic, but really liked how it looked. Hey. Although it did have one more element that got some press. Actress Kelly O'Hara, who has appeared on Broadway many times, she played Lucy, Dracula's main victim. In what has been suggested to be lengthy and unnecessary, O'Hara appeared nude for quite a long time in one scene. Nobody could really figure out what the director was going for, as it seemed to be brought about by nothing that preceded. Oh, uh, okay. Well, I, I think about the, the the Coppola film with Gary Oldman as Dracula. Like, there was a lot of sex and nudity in that show, but that was Coppola's, like, interpretation of that thing. Like, there's some sensuousness to it. There's some sexuality going on. There's some sexual charisma. But on stage, and especially on the Broadway stage, if you're not yeah. expecting it... And if, it's, and if it's not earned, I feel like nudity has to be earned. Right, and, right, right. And there's, you know, I mean, not to go into all of the uh, details of this, but I, I'm always curious um, about representation and misrepresentation and underrepresentation in theater and film. But like, of men and women, women are like 90% of the time more likely to be filmed nude or partially nude than men. Yep. And then of those women, 70% of women are Latino. I have not heard that. That's interesting. Yeah. And because it's authentically their figure, as opposed to uh, more prestigious white actors who will say, I'll, I'll want a body double for this. 
if right. you're showing this part of my body or that part of my body, or if you want a full nude, you can use somebody else. Um, and part huh. of that comes from just wanting the job and right. that's the job. And, right. And also culturally <laughs> speaking, they're much more, you know, liberal. Yeah. Yeah. I guess so. Yeah. You know, <laughs> it's, it's kind of funny. I, I didn't watch it. I'm, I'm compelled to go watch it. I, and, but not necessarily for this reason. Uh, <laughs> everybody in this last season of euphoria on HBO was like, geez, there was a lot of penis. Hey, <laughs> like, all right, we're getting representation. <laughs> hey, let's go. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's just shocking that that's, you know, that yeah. hasn't been the case for so long and that it is just an expectation that women are going to do that on stage or yeah. on camera. Okay. You'll just do that. Right. Cause, cause frankly, everybody wants to see it. Right. No. Right. That's the assumption. Good Lord. Good Lord. Okay. So you think that would be it for vampire musicals, right? No. Nope. So up to this point, we've run into several problems that may not be specifically related to vampires, but rather how to make a vampire story into a big commercial musical. Perhaps we're just getting the wrong creative team in place, right? I mean, on the last one, you had Frank Wildhorn, but you had people who were like, eh, they might be a playwright. I don't know. So let's offer one up. Let's offer one up with a lot of big names who have had a lot of success on Broadway. That might be it, right? Here's hoping. <laughs> yeah. So here we go. First, we focus on a vampire franchise with a built-in audience. Got it. The Vampire Chronicles. Anne Rice. Okay. Perfect. Do you know about this one? Uh, no. Oh, my God. So the movie, Interview of the Vampire, that's been done. So let's do the sequel book as a musical, The Vampire Lestat. Perfect. Oh. Uh-huh. Uh huh. And I'm reading the novel right now. Let me just give you a summary of the novel. So just as Interview with the Vampire was the story of Louis, the sequel focuses on the charismatic and sensuous vampire who created Louis, Lestat. I love this. Francesca, you are like completely gobsmacked here. I am. I've got my <laughs> fingers to my head, my jaws to the floor. I'm listening in complete disbelief as if the words cannot continue to come from oh, your mouth, oh. but they are. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right, so, all right. so yeah, um, continuing with the summary of the novel, we find Lestat has become something of a dark glam metal musician, and he is sitting down to write his autobiography before setting out on a world tour with his band. No. I love the book. It's really good. From his non-consensual creation as a vampire, Lestat struggles with his dark gift, but soon learns to love the power he has as a vampire and the thrill of the hunt and the kill. Within a few months of becoming a vampire, Lestat bestows the dark gift on his mother, Gabrielle, who was deathly ill and would have succumbed to her illness had Lestat not made her one of the undead. The two then become something of a couple, like they're companions now. So in their earthly roles, mother and son, but that doesn't exist anymore. They become kind of the perfect versions of themselves that they can be, or at least in physical form. Like she gets young and like her youthful body comes back to her and her hair gets full and, and, and luscious. And same with him. Like he, he, you know, he, his muscles become more taut and everything. And he's like six foot tall and just blonde and gorgeous and everything. And they intermingle with humans. Like they love being amidst humans and knowing that this is their prey and they are among their prey, so it's thrilling for them. The two are accosted by a wily group of vampires who have been hiding in the shadows away from humanity in something of a cult led by the sensuous and devious Armand. It's like the Lost Boys. <laughs> yes, yeah, exactly. Lestat foils this cult as he discovers he actually has more power than any of these ancient vampires, and once he is convinced of his power, he consistently tests his abilities, searching out other vampires until he finds the originator of all vampires, the queen of the damned, Akasha. 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 I feel like already we can hear the music. Akasha. So it's a pretty sweeping story. Like there's some cool scenes. Like I, I there are bootleg versions of this on, on YouTube that you can watch the entire yeah. thing. And there are two different versions of it. Like there's the out of town tryout in San Francisco, which uh, from what I understand was much bigger and more impressive than what finally went to Broadway. So anyway, huh. pretty sweeping story. He struggles with the limits of his own power and the loss of the companions he brings into his life who all seem to find a reason to leave him. Hmm. So we're kind of building something of a tragic character here. I mean, it's got some great opportunity for character development and seeing some great flaws. Plus, we've got these 
fantastical scenes that are going to involve huge numbers of vampires and seeing what they can do. <laughs> it seems like an, a neat idea. Like I can see a choreographer just really having a ball with trying to figure out how to make that kind of movement yeah. of these like ancient vampires who believe that they're supposed to be away from the mortal world. Like that's the yeah. cult that they're in. They believe that. That as well as like this concept of the animal that they're attuned to this. Right. Like, and how they use their wings to dance. Like, what is that? Ooh, yes. See, there you yeah. go. I see you doing it already. I love it. <laughs> so let's, so let's put the creative team together. Let's get the director of Broadway's Beauty and the Beast. Cause that had some cool, like big elements of kind of fear to it as well. Like you put some of that into it. Okay. Ooh, let's get the book writer for the Broadway hits Beauty and the Beast, Lion King and Aida. And speaking of Lion King and Aida, let's get Elton John to write the music oh, and his okay. longtime writing partner, Bernie Toppin for the lyrics. Wow. You have this huge team on this. I mean, yeah, that's, those are some big names. On top of that, let's get some amazing new ideas for scenery projection yeah yeah we love projection this was used quite well in the out-of-town trial in san francisco and most reviewed mentioned how the innovative plays use of projections were oh cool one example is a visual representation of what goes on in the mind of a vampire when taking a victim now from what Ooh. i understand yeah okay check this out from what i understand in Anne rice's vampire mythos vampires can't actually have sex Aha. but the act of biting in drinking is basically orgasmic cool well, that would have to be because I think, you know, human beings only need three things, right? In life, they need food, they need water, and they need procreation in order to survive and have their species survive. So so let's let's put all of those things into one act, and there you are. Yeah. So cool. when a vampire would take a victim on stage, this glorious animation would play behind them on the projection screens, and it's look like, it looks like you're traveling like a microscopic being through well-lit blood vessels as though yeah. flying through these great caverns. Cool. It, was, it was really cool. Well, it fell flat. Not only <laughs> were pretty much all the creative decisions criticized in reviews in San Francisco, but the casting was hit pretty hard as well. Basically, it yeah. sounded like the script was too ambitious, cramming in way too much, and not giving the characters enough time to develop at all. They were basically bouncing like ping pong balls from moment to moment through vast eras in time. And on top of that, the moments were frankly boring, but perhaps this is because we didn't have actors that were capable of doing much with the script. Ooh. Let's see. Oh, hey, what did they do when they took it to Broadway? Oh, they took out a lot of the projections and huge sections of the script were rewritten, which basically only made it seem like randomized events in the life of an incredibly well-written source character. <laughs> it was like a clip show yeah yeah so here's uh one of my favorite lines from the san francisco reviews didactic disjointed oddly miscast confusingly designed and floundering in an almost unrelentingly saccharine score by elton john zing oh man youch he had his thesaurus open that day youch here's my favorite review from broadway let us only pray that the three strikes and you're out rule applicable in baseball and in some states uh, law enforcement practices also applies to musical theater genres. That would mean that the woeful Lestat, which just opened at the palace, is truly the silver nail in the coffin of vampire musicals Yikes. that it deserves to be. <laughs> Yikes! Oh, no! I mean, what beautiful, beautiful oh. poetry. Damning yep. poetry of a review, but damn. Oh. Oh. Let me see. I gotta look it up, because I didn't put it in here, but I need to uh, find out just how many performances we had. Oh, man. So let's see, it should be added that this was the first project from the newly formed Warner Brothers Theater Ventures. You see, Disney opened up a very large floodgate when it started turning its properties into Broadway smash hits, okay? So now many motion picture studios realize that we have this huge library of content that we can just try to adapt for the stage. It seems to be, you know, a golden ticket, just like it is doing for Disney. We throw a lot of money at it and we have these great things. It'll be great, right? Mm -hmm. Well, Lestat would have been its first to launch their new theater venture on Broadway. Mm 
And huh. I mean, by this time, Disney had already had several hits, a few flops. I mean, Tarzan was in there somewhere and it didn't do great, but it's standing on Broadway. It was still pretty healthy. Yeah. Warner didn't have that time in the great white way under its belt to know just how to adjust things at the appropriate developmental stages to make Lestat truly successful. But based on that line from the Broadway review, it's just unfortunate that it had to be a vampire musical. Yeah. Because now the genre seems truly damned. Here we go. I found it. Opened on April 25th, 2006. Closed on May 28th, 2006. 39 performances. Ooh. Done. Ooh. Done. So what is it? Are vampire musicals cursed for Broadway? Or are all these failures just that they just happen to be vampire musicals? Uh, you know, I feel like there's just an expectation that comes with them. You know, I think that that's why sometimes the the grandeur spectacle falls, that, that film is capable of achieving falls flat on the stage. You know, and I think more and more people are really curious about seeing stripped back spectacle and more human spectacle. And I, I say that taking into consideration, especially huge hits like Hamilton. Oh, yeah. The costume, the costumes are beautiful, but they are quite like simple. They're not yes. terribly ornate. You know, they're, they're, they they serve the story in, in the barest way they can, which is what makes them so effective. Um, and the stage is, is also stripped back and, and it's brilliantly designed and as much effort and time, you know, a credit to the designers. It isn't, right. it isn't particularly grand as you would expect something to be. But, you know, I think Lin-Manuel said, you know, that the emphasis has to be on the lyrics. And if anything, including the performance, takes away from the words that are being said, this will fall flat. And I think I think more and more audiences are really looking to see quite human shows and um, yes. plays and musicals that they really connect to because I think they're excited for film and television to transcend us and take us to these really imaginative places um, that is much more believable because of the technology that we have and can use in that medium. And it's not to say that vampires can't thrive on stage. Yeah, I, I mean, there there have been some successes with vampires, and, and and more specifically on Broadway. Like all of these, all of these shows did great in uh, non-American markets. Mm. Like I think Lestat didn't do well in London, but like once it got to Tokyo or Germany or you know there were plenty of places that all three of these musicals did really really well just mm. never on Broadway. Yeah, I mean I think Broadway is still in in a kind of revival mode like Oh it is now, yeah. Let's let's kind of stop taking risks and uh, unless it's with someone or a team of someone's who can who have proved their track record and can make sure that we make some money, which I think, especially coming out of this pandemic, it's important that we keep Broadway alive. So I can't necessarily judge them for doing that, but at the same time, I you know, especially as a divisor, working with a lot of people who are curious about writing and producing their own work, um, right. there's a lot of exciting new stuff out there. Right, we sh we right. Shouldn't, we shouldn't have to rely on people who've already proven their worth because sometimes taking a risk is really important. Uh, right. I'd maybe advise against taking a risk on someone who's written another vampire musical. <laughs> but maybe maybe we get to see like a preview of that before the actual musical we're going to go see. Right, yeah, yeah. Do they rise from the ground? Do they rise from crypts? Do they fly? Do they float? What do they do? You know, mm -hmm. I mean, maybe, maybe it's just as a culture, we don't have enough universal ideas about vampires. Yeah. And, and I think we're afraid of breaking the mold too. I also think there's been so many, like, especially Twilight, that's already happened. That's already still a trend and still a thing that people are really attached to. So um, dare we suggest that vampires are capable of something else, if not more? Um, or will it just drown in the other sea of vampire stories? You know, you mentioned Beetlejuice, but also Young Frankenstein. Um, and I'm I, that film I watched growing up. It is my family's favorite film to watch together. It's my dad's favorite. And when my mom said, I've, I've, I've got you tickets to see it in, in England, he was like, you're joking. He's like, that's not going to be funny. And he said he'd never had a better time um, at the theater. And, and he's saying that to his daughter, whose life is theater. And I was like, but dad, what about my 
tiny <laughs> black box shows. But no, I mean, it was, it's great. You know, it's great that there are people who can who can take something that's really well known, especially a film, and bring it to stage because you know there is this war and I, I'm I'm not thrilled with how many musicals are becoming movies because that means that fewer people are gonna investigate the musical theater world and actually go and see these plays live. Yeah. Right. Um, that being said, I've heard nothing but grand reviews about the most recent ones of West Side Story and Tick Tick Boom. So it's it's just a balance, right? So if 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 the yeah. stage can do the same thing and take films and make them really, really solid musicals that have uh have strength and, and have an audience that keeps coming yeah. back like Beetlejuice, you know, that's, that's stellar. There was one other franchise I thought that might work because it did have a good built-in audience and, and a more directed thing that, you know, it's not, it, it's for a very niche group, but they could do it was a uh, true blood. Ah, uh, yeah. You know, the Southern vampire series. I mean, it's very sexy and, and, you know, it had, it had a lot of draw, but I don't know. I don't know. I'm just spitballing ideas. What a topic, what a story, what an adventure we've gone on here. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, Francesca, thank you so much for joining me on this one. I don't know Thanks if we solved me. anything, but. <laughs> no, I think there's more questions. But yeah, I, I have more questions now. <laughs> that's that's what good art is. It should provoke more questions always. If we found yeah. the answer, then what's the point? And I can't wait to hear from you in the future when you're like, yeah, I listen to those musicals. They suck. <laughs> That or my only audition song ever is from, <laughs> and uh, I've I've booked every role with it. So that would be amazing. That would not be stellar. Oh, I'd be thrilled. actually. I'll, I'll I'll end with this. One of the high points of the Lestat musical that everybody commented on: the woman who played his mother character, Gabrielle, uh, in the song where she is describing to him the reason why she has to leave him. Like she's absolutely compelled. There's no way they can go on together as a couple. The woman who sings that is Carolee Carmelo. She has this belt that is just outstanding. Uh. And this song gives her the opportunity to do it. So if you can look it up, I think it's the song called The Crimson Kiss. But good Lord, like she soars through that song. And you're like, I would go see that for that alone and then leave it intermission. Yeah. <laughs> Very cool. Yeah. Very so cool. there we go. Look that up, guys. Um, but anyway... This has been Francesca Bentashej uh, coming to me from Savannah. And I am Aaron Odom in Sheridan, Wyoming from Trident Theater. Thank you for listening. And we will catch you in another two weeks with another episode of Euripides Humanities. I'll see you at intermission.